We have a very dark history. Nothing brings me joy. <laughs> we have to dismantle this idea of the Jews of Muslim land as if one story, one narrative can provide us explanation for everything that happened from Morocco to Afghanistan. We cannot treat Muslim societies as one monolith. Welcome to Joy in Conversation, a podcast about Jewish history and culture. It's with scholars, but it's for everyone. I'm Dan, and I'll be your host. Join me and find Joy in Conversation because, well, it's a mitzvah. How good does it feel when you learn something new? Something that shatters an old way of thinking, especially when that way of thinking was well, maybe underdeveloped, or let's be honest, flimsier than perhaps we'd like to admit. For me, it's euphoric to confront the newness of knowledge, especially when I'm invited into a lush and vibrant world that I never knew existed. These moments give pause, and they're also so humbling, but really in the best of ways. They make me seek out more answers because they raise a lot of questions. It's enlivening and energizing to walk across the threshold from obliviousness to revelation. Really, for me, it's transcendent. And in a lot of cases, it's also necessary and long overdue. This was how I felt the first time I read Roy Mutehida's classic text on Iranian history, The Mantle of the Prophet. Oi, <laughs> I can already feel my audience shaking their heads. Some of you are probably thinking, this sounds way too obscure for me. While I bet others are thinking, who is this guy who hasn't read anything published in the last 30 years? Well, whether you've never heard of this book, or you wish I'd stay a bit more current on my historiography, let's just say that this is my first real encounter with the depth of modern Iranian history. It was a seminal moment of learning for me. For the first time, I felt less like an American struggling to not mispronounce Iran, and more like somebody who could actually see Iranian politics and society beyond the few harmful tropes that are etched into an American consciousness. From here, I read more about Iran's intellectual history, really basking in the writings of Muslim thinkers like Ali Shariati and Abdul Karim Soroush. They asked existential questions about Islam, national identity, cultural imperialism, and what it means to be Iranian in a changing world of Western influence. I was also so fortunate to have teachers along the way who demystified Iranian history with so much compassion, but also with a critical lens. One of my teachers was Nagma Sarhabi. Nagma never let her students reinforce the preconceptions that they had when they walked into the classroom. So she pushed me beyond easy answers about Islam and Iran. These influences were so vital to my being able to think about Iranian society in more pluralistic terms, where I could be sensitive to the swirling and competing ideas circulating throughout the country and in the minds of its people. This electric feeling of learning and seeing the full humanity of people, it doesn't happen every day. So for me, these are special moments that elevate my mind and open my heart. They expand my scope of being and they build bridges across the world. It was this same feeling, that electric feeling of learning, that overtook me when I was reading Lior Sternfeld's book, Between Iran and Zion, Jewish Histories of 20th Century Iran. In its early pages, I was struck by the sentence, Jews did not live in a different universe. And there was a great deal of mutual cultural influence. So much is contained in that one sentence alone. So much about reciprocity and relations integration and social standing. But it was a little further into the book that I realized I need to talk to Lior. I read a passage about an Iranian Jew who became a member of the Tuda, the Communist Party in Iran, 
In this passage, he described his political origin story. Quote, they invited me to stay for a lecture. I started to go there on a regular basis to play ping pong and listen to lectures. They talked about equality and basic economy and taught us all the Marxist and leftist ideals. Until this day, almost 70 years later, I still play ping pong and I still believe in these ideals. So I read that sentence and was blown away. Clearly, Lior is a scholar capable of correcting misconceptions about Iran, but I also got the sense that he knew how to be playful as a teacher. He did not have to include a sentence about playing ping pong in Persia, but he did, and that's my kind of historian. Sharp and insightful, but with a bit of whimsy. So it got me thinking, what else does Lior have to say? What else does he have to teach me, and what could I learn from a conversation with him? I wanted to find out. I had so many questions going into our conversation. What was life like for Jews in Iran during the 20th century? What role did Jews play in the cultural and political transformation Iran underwent during this time? How did Jews contribute to Iranian society? Were Jews prominent in any way? What stories tend to be told about Iranian Jews? And what are the stories that deserve more attention? So let's listen to what Lior had to say about these and so many other questions that I asked him. Yellow, let's learn together. I'm Lior Sternfeld. I'm assistant professor of history and Jewish studies at Penn State University. I'm a social historian of the modern Middle East with emphasis on Iran and Jewish communities of the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa. I'm a scholar of Iran. I study the better part of the last decade, uh, history of Iranian Jews. They are part of me. I'm not sure that (laughs) I'm part of them, but they are part of me now. I think a good place to start is to just get a sense of the size of Iran's Jewish population. Better yet, we should really get a sense of Iran's makeup as a whole. As almost every Iranian Jew will be able to tell you, Jews have lived in Iran for 2,700 years. Throughout most of the 20th century, the community size was about 80 to 100,000 Jews. And in the 21st century, the numbers are highly contested. But so, for example, most recently, the rabbi of Iran said in an interview that the community size is around 15,000. The official census number point at 12,000. In the diaspora, some people say that it's closer to 9,000. People that I speak to from within Iran say that the numbers are as high as 20,000 or 25,000, depending on who counts and who's counted? <laughs> so this is a great question because I think that it helps to understand Iran. Iran is actually a country of minorities. While 95% of the population is Muslim Shia, in terms of ethnicity, there are 27 different minority groups, ethnic, lingual, and religious minorities. Only 50% of the population is Persian Muslim. So the rest are Azeris and Baluchis and Luris and Jews and Zoroastrians and many other minority groups, Sunni Muslims. So I I think that it helps to complicate a little bit the image that we have on Iran and the Iranian society. All right. So Iran is a country of minorities and Jews are a well-established part of this ethnic and religious mosaic. But what does this mean in terms of religious expression? Is this identity something that's on display or is it downplayed? Historically, has Jewishness been nominal or instead has it been something central to the way identity has been constructed and put on display by Jews in Iran? In the post-revolutionary period, when religion becomes such a central mean of identification in Iran, the Jewish identity I think, prevails over the ethnic identity. However, it's also, at the same time, I want to say this is almost inseparable because part of their identity is them being Persian Jews that have lived in Iran for so many years, for so many centuries. 
And the social and cultural developments of the 20th century actually helped to glue these two elements together, the Jewish identity and the Persian identity, which together projected a kind of Iranian Jewish national identity. So we're going to stay here in this space of unpacking the ways Jewish and Persian identity were glued together. But if we are going to linger here, we really should realize that this is a fairly modern way of identifying. And the way different facets of identity intersect and manifest themselves in the 20th century, well, that's very different from in the past. They're not static across time. So we shouldn't assume that the 20th century Persian Jewish identity resembles that of the 19th century or the 16th century, or even in the centuries prior to the arrival of Islam. Let's return to my conversation with Lior and let's start figuring this out. So thinking about that, this notion of an Iranian Jewish national identity, the historical longevity of Jewish presence in Iran, I'm curious to know what are some of the dominant narratives about Jewish history in Iran? And what do they fail to capture? If Jews have been there for so long, if there is this Jewish-Iranian identity that's been established, do the narratives that we're often telling take this into account? Or is there something missing in the stories typically told about this community and its history? What I'm going to say now is pretty much consensus that under the pre-modern monarchies, Jews fared relatively okay. They suffered some kind of ritual discrimination, the notions of impurity that later appeared in the theology of the Shia Islam started in Zoroastrianism. And then it got to this point that Jews actually welcomed the Islamic conquest of Iran. Under Islam, they had their protected status of people of the book. There wasn't one unifying code of behavior towards Jews. So it differed a lot by social, cultural, economic situation. So in times of tranquility, hardships on the general population, Jews relatively felt safer and more prosperous. In times of wars, in times of drought and other crises, Jews suffered by the virtue of being minority. All right, so now we're really ready to get to the 20th century and think about the way Jews' social status and even their legal and political statuses changed over time. It was packed differently in the early 20th century with the constitutional revolution in Iran that actually turned all Iranians from imperial subjects into citizens with all its civil meanings. So Iranian Jews became citizens with agency and constitution that pretty much drew the line of belonging. And ever since then, it's been a game. It's a dance. (laughs) Two steps to one side, one step to the other. Ever since the Constitutional Revolution, this is what we talk about in terms of legal status and even social status that is reflected by the political participation. You're mentioning the 1906 Constitutional Revolution, and perhaps for people who have a vague familiarity with Iran's 20th century history in the United States, that might not be what immediately comes to mind when thinking about revolutions or defining what Iranian politics look like. So I think it would be helpful if you could share a little bit about that particular revolution. All right. So the Constitutional Revolution, it came 1906 to 1911. We have to remember that this was, again, I always like to put it in the greater context of the region, right? The Ottoman Empire had gone through a similar process of understanding the relationship between the ruler, the sultan, and the people, and the intelligentsia, and the middle class, and outside powers like Russia, or Britain, or France and the will to limit the powers of the ruler. So the same kind of conversations took place almost everywhere around Iran. 
from the 1870s on on. Newspapers that talked about the need of constitution were smuggled into Iran from the Ottoman Empire. And then the revolution started, the demand for constitution and parliament and representation. There was something very chaotic in this revolution, but also something very optimistic. And I think that this is kind of a thread that we see throughout the political crisis in Iran, that there's always this chaos living with great optimism, that this event will change everything. Overall, the revolution succeeded. A constitution was written. Iranians became citizens. There was an element of representation by elections. Religious minorities were protected and represented. It succeeded. It created some checks and balances on the king, on the Shah. In the aftermath of World War I, we see the final demise of the Qajar dynasty and the ascendance of the Pahlavi dynasty, which is going to be the last dynasty to rule over Iran. And we see also a different kind of nation-building project that prioritized Iranian-Persian identity over Muslim identity. The minorities that embraced it or succeeded under this new nation-building project were minorities that Persian was their identity as well like Jews. It actually opened the door for Iranian Jews to celebrate their Persian identity. And because Islam was on decline, it allowed Iranian Jews to hold better ground to struggle for equality and upward mobility in in Iran. So let's pause and recap. So far, we see that Iran is a country of minorities. And Jews have long been present in Iran, with this presence stretching back millennia. And as the religious and political landscape shifted in Iran, so too did the legal status of Jews. But really, it was also for everyone in Iran. The 1906 revolution was a fundamental shift in the relationship between people and the state. This wasn't particular to Jews. It's not like they were suddenly emancipated and given equality. It was a watershed moment for everyone in the country. With all that in mind, I'm curious to know if there are some examples where Jews were prominent in Iranian society. I think when we think about minorities, sometimes we can assume that they exist on the periphery, somewhat disengaged from these political happenings. It sounds like that's not the case in what you're describing. What does assimilation mean? look like in Iran for those Jews who leaned into it and found it beneficial? The peak of assimilation and over-representation was in the 70s. We actually talk about a very long process, very long but very short in time. The JDC, the Jewish Distribution Committee, what we call the Joint, started to work in Iran in 1941. During World War II, there was a wave of Polish refugees that came to Iran, and the Joint came To help finding solutions for the Jews, some of them were placed in refugee camp in Iran, others needed to be transferred to Palestine. So the joint came to work, and shortly after arrival, they decided that they are going to remain in Iran and work with the local Jewish community, so not just for the Polish refugees. And they wanted to map the Jewish communities of Iran. So they went across the country, and they found that there were about 100,000 Jews living in Iran. 10% of them belonged to the country's elite, 10% were part of the new urban middle class, and 80% were lower middle class and lower class and impoverished Jews that lived in the social and geographical peripheries of Iran. In 1977, the same organization conducted a new survey of Iranian Jews, and they found that there were Once again, about 100,000 Jews in Iran, 10% still belong to the country's elites, but then 80% belong to the middle class and upper middle class, and 10% were still impoverished lower classes. And this is the story of the 20th century Iranian Jewish history. The over-presentation is what we see at the peak of this period. I would say that Partly it's because of the policies of Reza Shah, because of investment in Jewish education 
because of also the relations between Iran and Israel that were very close allies and many Israeli companies came to work in Iran and many of them hired Iranian Jews to run the operations in Iran. Jews were overrepresented in journalism. There were Shaul Bachash and Hamas Arashar and many that came to very high positions in the printed press and in TV. In academia, two of 18 members of the Royal Academy were Jews. So it's, again, much more than their part of the population. One of the biggest plastic manufacturers in Iran was Habib al Khanyan, who was executed by the revolution later. He was the owner of a big plastic company, and he owned one of the Plasco buildings, which was a signature of the Tehran skyline for many years. One of the biggest pharmaceutical companies was run by Habib Levy, who was a prominent Iranian Jew. Jews were everywhere. Let's say that in the 1970s, we see this mindset of Iranian Jews that they achieved it. They got to the point that there's no conflict between their different identities or different components of their identities. So it sounds like the Pahlavi dynasty was actually incredibly fruitful for Iranian Jews. Should we then assume that there was no or limited Jewish involvement or support for the revolution that would come? Also, prior to that, should we assume that Jews were not engaged in any kind of critical or radical politics under the Pahlavi dynasty? This is what I call the unintended consequences. Jews integrated or felt integrated so much that they stopped thinking of their needs, of their priorities as, you know, from the perspective of being Jews in Iran. They started to think of themselves, maybe first and foremost as Iranians who are of Jewish faith. So in the 50s, there was over-representation again of Jews in the Communist Party, but it was because this was the only party that accepted non-Muslims as members and openly and aggressively fought against anti-Semitism and discrimination. So this was one way to be involved. And later in the 50s and 60s, when also they were on this path, on this trajectory for upward mobility and better integration in the society, Anti-Semitism didn't feel as the same kind of problem that it felt in the 40s and 50s. And it allowed them to act as Iranians, to see the grievances of the regular Iranians, right? Rather than their own community that benefited from the, the Shah's policies. But also it opened their eyes to see the dictatorship and the corruption of the Shah and his family. And it's not something that was across the board with the Jewish community. Many of them remained loyal to the Shah, stayed out of politics, but this was not the rule. I mean, this was not, uh, you know, universal behavior of, of Jews in Iran. Many of them went to the university, they joined student organizations, student clubs, some of them were underground student organizations, and they were more, you know, they felt for people that became very prominent later in the 70s, in the early 70s, actually went to prison for their political activism as part of the opposition. And in prison, they started to transform, like to think about their activism and how to recruit the community for that. And it worked in some ways, it didn't work in other ways. But we see that, you know, they were able to create alliances with other groups that participated in the revolution. And also to make the case that the Shah was a dictator. It's sort of an obligation to join our non-Jewish brothers and sisters in their struggle against this dictatorship. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to tell how convincing the case was. But, you know, in 1978, this group won the elections for the leadership of the community. So we can argue that at the very least, it touched slightly more than half of the members of the Jewish community. So this was the story, again, very briefly, the story of the participation of Jews in the revolution and what led them to it. It's really interesting hearing you talk about Jewish participation in the Communist Party, Jewish participation in the revolution, and assimilation and a sense of Iranian identity 
facilitating these forms of political action. I say it's surprising because wouldn't one intuitively think that the Holocaust would have perhaps created uh, an atmosphere of Jews feeling less secure at this point in the 20th century? And also with the ascent of Zionism and the establishment of the state of Israel, perhaps wouldn't that have created a real ripe atmosphere for the dispersion of Jews from Iran to Palestine and later Israel? So this is one of the paradoxes that we have to deal with. The Jewish population of Iran was very empathetic to Zionism. And the Zionist movement could operate almost openly in Iran, certainly after World War II. Iran was actually served as a base for Zionist, you know, aliyah from Iraq, Afghanistan, India in the late 40s and early 50s. So why is it that the overwhelming majority of Iranian Jews chose to stay? The answer is complicated, but part of it is at the same time that Israel was established, they started the journey towards integration in the Iranian society. They finally saw that the tunnel is long, very long, but there is a light at the end of it. Israel and Iran had a relationship. They had relations, they had direct flights of Velal from Tel Aviv to Tehran. Unlike other Jews from the Middle East, Iranian Jews could travel back and forth. They had a more sober idea of what was waiting on the other side of the Zionist promise. And we see letters that Iranian Jews that immigrated to Israel sent back to their communities in Iran. It's very sobering and very realistic. And this is not what we expected, they tell their families in Iran. We are being discriminated against. We have limited opportunities. So stay in Iran. Stay until we inform you that the time is more suitable. It's the same time that they already start to see the fruits of their efforts in Iran. They are better integrated. They enjoy better opportunities in Iran. They can travel to Israel. So again, this is a privilege that Jews from other Arab countries don't have. So they support Zionism, but they develop this understanding that Zionism is good for Jews who cannot stay in their homes. So it's good for the Jews of Iraq, it's good for the Jews of Egypt, but nothing prevents us from staying here. So we can stay here and support the, the Zionist ideas. What does this say for people who think, well, we can study the history of the Jews in Muslim lands, as though the Jews in that sentence are singular, as though Muslim lands are monolithic? Yeah, I think that there is a trend in scholarship of Jewish histories of the Middle East in the past I'd say 20 years or so, that we really start to look into singular societies and put them in context of the local history, of the local society, of local culture, rather than examining them through the prism of Jews of Muslim lands. Because the circumstances under which the Jews of Yemen had to live are not similar to the consequences under which the Jews of Egypt had to live. And there are certainly none of them have anything in common with the Jews of Iran that still has the second biggest Jewish community in the Middle East outside Israel. We cannot understand relationship between Jews and Muslims in different places as a monolith. There's so much in Lior's comments for us to digest right now. I'm struck by the way Lior's dismantling the narrative of Jews in Muslim lands. He's reminding us that broad swaths of humanity across time and space can't really be encapsulated into such a narrow story. And also, his accounts of Jewish assimilation into Iran, well, for me, they really underscore the need to continue telling stories that go beyond familiar tropes of antagonism between Jews and Muslims. And for anyone who's tuned into the geopolitics of Israeli-Iranian relations today, but didn't know the history of the 20th century, Lior is really getting us past the saber-rattling that we may have grown accustomed to in recent years. Now let's return to my conversation with Lior and learn more about how he sees his work in the greater scheme of raising people's awareness about the Middle East, about Iran, and also about Jewish history. How do you think about the contribution you're making to this discourse 
as it perhaps disrupts or questions some of the internalized logic of what's come before. There was so little written on Iranian Jews compared to other places, compared to other cases, that we had to create some kind of ground to step on before we revise and revolutionize the field. I guess that my first goal is just to create this baseline, understanding that we have to talk about Iranian society, that Iranian Jewish history is is Jewish history, but it's also Iranian history. And we can learn a lot about the history of Iran when we examine Iranian Jewish history. And we learn a lot about the history of Middle Eastern Jews when we look at the story of Iranian Jews, even in the, you know, the most basic understanding of compare and contrast. <laughs> Let's do that right now. Let's look at Jewish history as Iranian history and think about how we can learn about Jews and Iran. And let's do that through one individual. You write about Dr. Rahullah Sapir in your book. So thinking about this individual, can you just share a little bit about an understanding of some trends that speak to what was happening with Jews, what was happening with Iran during his heyday and during the years of his contributions? Probably one of the most well-known Iranian Jews to the average Iranian. So he was a physician. He worked in a Tehran hospital in the 1930s. And then in the hospital, he saw a Jewish patient, a Jewish woman being mistreated and insulted because of her religion. And he decided to start his own clinic that would provide good care with no discrimination to everyone. So he started it as a, in a side room in a synagogue in Tehran, and it grew and became at least an important hospital in that part of Tehran. Throughout the years, it was very instrumental in creating one of the first nursing programs in the country. It was, you know, one of the things that everyone was very proud of. Eleanor Roosevelt, when she came to Iran, she visited the hospital. The Queen of Iran made few visits to the hospital. So it was the pride of the Jewish community. It was the pride of the Iranian state. It was very much part of Tehran. And during the revolution, the hospital fulfilled its mission by being the only hospital in Tehran that didn't turn in the wounded protesters to the hands of the Savak, the secret police. At the entrance to the hospital, there's a sign that reads in Hebrew and Persian, love thy neighbor like thyself. And even though some of the administrators and some of the physicians were not supportive of the revolution at all, they still saw it as a very much, you know, continuation of Dr. Sapir's legacy. And this was very much the case of humanitarian, if we know that Dr. Sapir is one of these model figures for Iranian Jews and he's prominent in the Iranian society, I think that he tells us to, to learn a thing or two about the relationship between Iranian Jews and Iran and, and so on. Another person who really caught my eye was Edna Sabet. Would you mind sharing a little bit about Edna's story and how can we think about Dr. Sapir and Edna Sabet? together to understand the different identities, the different trajectories that people took in the way they engaged with politics and society. These are two ends of the spectrum, because if Dr. Sapir symbolizes the beginning of the process when Jews were still marginalized, he started his project because he witnessed anti-Semitism and discrimination. Edna Sabet symbolizes more than all the integration, with a tragic end nonetheless. She was of a Jewish middle-class family. She went to study in the university, became involved in few underground leftist organizations. She joined Peikar, which is a leftist guerrilla movement, opposed the Shah, and eventually she participated in the revolution. She was prisoned later by the revolution because of the turning of the revolutionary government against some of the fractions that participated in the coalition, and she was executed in 1982. I'm saying that she's the other end of the spectrum because I think that her Jewishness played very insignificant role in her understanding of herself or her activism. She worked together in a Muslim underground guerrilla movement. Her partner was not Jewish. 
This is the realization of Dr. Sapir's vision, right? That someone who's entirely integrated, Judaism is a biographical part for them and not something that, you know, limits their opportunities or decisions in the Iranian society. The way that she pursued her path was not maybe what Dr. Sapir imagined, but the idea that her Jewishness is not going to limit her, I think, is something that in Dr. Sapir's generation was unimaginable. We haven't talked about the post-revolutionary experience. How can we understand their social and political roles today? You know, we're decades removed from the revolution, we're decades into a different sort of relationship between Israel and Iran. So what does that now mean? Is this a society today that has seen the reversal of 100 years of integration? Or has it been maintained in ways that perhaps aren't commonly appreciated by observers who aren't of that community? I'd say that it's it's both. They certainly don't enjoy the freedoms that they had before the revolution, but also they are not terrified, persecuted minority that lives in fear and behind this iron curtain, as we sometimes tend to imagine. There were ups and downs since the revolution in the relations between the government and the majority society and Jews. In the beginning of the revolution, they imagined that the revolution can deliver not an Islamic republic, but an Iranian republic. But then in May 1979, Iran executed Habib al-Khanian, and it was a sham trial, right? He was accused of being a spy, spreading corruption on earth. And he was he was arrested and executed because of his role in the Jewish community. And he's openly supporting Zionism in the times of the Shah, which was not a criminal act whatsoever. And his execution really terrified the community, and the leadership of the community went to meet with uh, Khomeini. And then Khomeini issued this ruling that Iranian Jews are brothers and sisters, Zionists are the enemy. And I half-jokingly always say that Iran is the only country in the world that actually differentiate between Judaism and Zionism, because the understanding is that as long as you accept this animosity between Israel and Iran and understand that Israel represents Zionism and Iranian Jews represent Judaism, then Iranian Jews can live freely, they can practice. You know, there are more kosher restaurants in Tehran than many American cities. So you talk with leaders of the community and they will tell you that synagogues today are more active than they were 40 years ago. Because many ironies and paradoxes of the revolution was that because it's Islamic revolution, the state supports and sponsors some of the religious institutions. And synagogues are beneficiaries of this system. So they are better funded. They are not funded only by the community, but also by the government. And no one can openly support Israel in the public sphere. But Iranian Jews, they still carry this mission of fighting for equality, for their place in the society. And sometimes it's harder. For example, during the presidency of Ahmadinejad, it was harder. But even then, like the Jewish representative in the parliament, in the parliament, in the speech in parliament, criticized Ahmadinejad for his Holocaust denial. And Prominent thinkers, intellectuals, wrote op-eds in Iranian newspapers criticizing Ahmadinejad for his Holocaust denial. So it started another public conversation on the Holocaust and history and so on. Under President Rouhani, Jews achieved many of the things that they were fighting for for many years. For example, uh, there was a law that passed that exempted Jewish students from attending school on Saturdays because of Shabbat. Uh, in Iran, Friday is the day off and, and Saturday is a regular day. So the law exempted Jewish students from attending school on Saturday. The government unveiled official monument commemorating the Jewish fallen soldiers in the Iran-Iraq war, which finally let them be part of the most defining event of post-revolutionary Iran. So there is this official recognition in the Jewish participation. 
So, I mean, it, as I said, like throughout most of modern history, there's progress and regress and progress and developments and things that need to be taken care of and addressed. And it's not perfect. It's not easy to be an Iranian in 2021. It's certainly not easy to be an Iranian Jew, but they are not uh, speechless, agentless participants or subjects. Why is it that you've come to study this history? And why are you passionate about it now when perhaps as a university student, the passion wasn't already well established? The reason that I was uninterested is that, as I said, it goes back to the lack of scholarship. There was one book that was written in 1961, and everybody used it. And it was a list of all the pogroms and all the sad, terrible events that happened to Jews. And this was history of Iranian Jews, like from 2,700 years ago until today. And it's not interesting. I mean, okay, we got the point. Maybe there's nothing to study there. <laughs> but then when I, completely by coincidence, came across the story of the Jewish hospital during the revolution and said, okay, so it doesn't help us understand how we got to participation of Jewish hospital in the revolution of 1979. There was another book that came out a few years before I started grad school of Daniel Tzadik between foreigners and she, And this was an eye-opening text for me because it was the first text of history of Iranian Jews in the 19th century that tried to establish school of thought regarding Iranian Jewish history. And I said, okay, so we have now better understanding of the 19th century. It helps me to understand how we got to the 20th century. Now I have to fill in this gap between the late 19th century to the late 20th century. And this was my mission. And I, I am passionate about it. And I hope that my passion goes to my students. And I think that they want to study this kind of history. And they want to see you know, the possibilities of examining the Jewish communities from with the context of their societies and not just as passive players in history that is written somewhere else. Lior's sentiment about why he was at one point in his life uninterested with studying Iranian Jewish history, well, that really resonates so much with me. For too long, I saw Jewish history as a somber series of stories featuring people who were displaced and persecuted time and time again. I asked myself, where's the humanity in only learning about the moments when people are dehumanized? What are the redeeming qualities of life that we can affirm and celebrate? Talking to Lior, I saw someone else who's searching for knowledge beyond a single dimension of Jewish history. And in having this conversation with him, I found complexity. What he shared isn't without sorrow, but it's also not without joy. So coming out of this time with Lior, moving ahead, I know that I won't rely on vague narratives like the Jews of Muslim lands because it's so static. We just saw how inadequate it is to think about Jews and Muslims in Iran as being locked into a single dynamic together. So if these relationships are fluid and shifting just in an Iranian context alone, clearly that's the case elsewhere as well. And we have to continue asking questions and listening, especially to the stories and the storytellers who deserve our attention, but aren't always heard. So let's continue having these conversations. A special thanks to Lior Sternfeld. Lior, it was a real treat talking to you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Lior's book, Between Iran and Zion, is published by Stanford University Press and found wherever books are sold. Thanks, as always, to Nico Rivers for mixing and mastering joy in conversation. To learn more about Nico's work, visit nicoriversrecording.com. Alec Hudson is responsible for our graphic design and Klezmer theme song. Thanks to Alec for his talents and creativity. To learn more about Alec's designs, visit warbirdcreative.com. And for his music, visit alechudson.com. Our website design is by Jacob Lazaro. Our episodes feature music by the Boston-based Sephardic band, Voice of the Turtle. 
This group is no longer active, but their music is on Spotify, and their website remains a trove of Sephardic sounds. Listen and learn more at voiceoftheturtle.com. Thanks also to Blue Dot Sessions for making high-quality music available to creatives everywhere. And thanks to you, our audience, for your time and your curiosity. Stay engaged with joy and conversation by subscribing on your podcast platform of choice and by visiting our website, joyandconversationpodcast.com. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.